can argue if it is a zero or an O. Ah. Okay, so that was it. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, yeah, yeah, don't play. It is a series of questions. <laughs> and so five minutes as before, I will let you know when you have one minute left. One more minute. Uh, remember, submit what you have. I'm, I will close the thing, but one more minute.
OK, so time up, uh, submit, and be ready to start with Daniela here. Click buttons, click buttons. Already, guys? Finished? Yes? Awesome. OK. So today, I think we're starting with the good stuff, finally. Um, statistics. Who here has used statistics when you know analyzing data, has worked with? Ah, so loads of you. Ah, this is good. So I think we're going to have a good discussion today and maybe tomorrow. OK, so today we're going to start seeing something uh, related to data analysis techniques. Of course, again, I repeat, this is very general, as everyone will have a different data set that, will be, uh, that they will be working with. But hopefully, again, these are principles that apply uh, just across the board. So of course, the most important and distinctive characteristic of big data, according to many people, of course, is the use of statistical methods in computational analysis to find correlations and to find meaning in data. So of course, the study of these statistical methods and computational approaches and what to choose with which data is, lies really at you know, the heart of data analysis. This is, I would probably say, one of the most, the most important points in, in data analysis. right? Besides, of course, taking care of everything we've seen before, how data were generated, the biases, all of this is very important. But the choices you make when analyzing data and statistical uh, yeah, choices you make along the way will definitely uh, impact your conclusions. OK, so you've taken this course, Hypothesis Driven Biology. So I'd like to ask someone, what do you usually do when you're going to do an analysis in Hypothesis Driven Biology? So you plan your experiment, collect data, and then what do you do? Can someone tell me what did you see in your course? Thales? Ah. <laughs> well, after you have run their experiments to mm -hmm. test your hypothesis, then you first, m you first must look to the data, do some like exploratory data analysis to understand the distribution of the data, if it has outliers, if it doesn't, so things like that. So then you can choose which is the appropriate way uh, to do a statistical test to test the hypothesis, to test if the hypothesis is corroborated by the data or if it is not. So I would say that also applies to what we're going to see here. But usually when you do hypothesis driven research, and you have a very clear hypothesis and you know you design how you're going to collect the data it usually comes with experimental design and when you do an experimental design you usually decide what test and how you're going to do it beforehand so usually i mean of course you have to make sure that you collected the data appropriately and everything that you said but usually you know if we have designed the experiment we know what we're doing, like if we've done it properly. Uh, and I, I just put here a picture. This is just one of the classical ways I think probably you've seen uh, before. It's just one of many different ways in which you can choose to analyze uh, your data. But you know, one of the more classical ones that maybe you've seen is uh, you have, you're doing hypothesis testing. So probably if you assume your data has some distribution, you decide a null hypothesis, an alternative hypothesis, and then choose your test according to, to your distributions and the, and the assumptions in your data, May, you know, make the test, and then either, I'm going to say this, accept or reject the null hypothesis. That's something that we are taught, right, in you know, books. And if, you, if you actually do design your experiment appropriately, then I think it's valid to do this. However, in data-driven research, in many cases, we don't have this. We have not designed that experiment, really. That can, that can come later. If you seek correlations and can generate hypotheses, then you say, oh, I'm going to design an experiment to test this. But when you download data, you have you know, all these sources of data. You have not really done this, this analysis. You have to follow a different approach, really. It's, it's probably a complementary approach. And, and it has many of the characteristics that Alice mentioned uh, just now. So here. Um, for data, uh, data analysis, usually authors classify um, the steps in data-driven analysis as these three steps. 
I must be honest, I learned this when I was planning this course because we all do it, but I didn't know it had a name. So actually people have uh, studied these steps that people follow and named them like this. So IDA followed by EDA and then followed by SAP. So initial data analysis, then exploratory data analysis as Talis mentioned, and then finally a statistical analysis plan. This is very important to take into account uh, because if we don't do any of these steps and we jump immediately to the statistics, which you know many of us have done, I have done that as I was learning you know, during my PhD and before, we can have a lot of problems and then we never end our project, right? Because like, oh no, this day, I mean, I have to do it again because you know, I didn't take this into account or this assumption is not uh, uh, you know, what we thought or worst case scenario, you actually don't realize this happened and then you just publish results and they're you know, not correct. Now, some authors consider IDA to be a part of EDA. I'm just saying this because if you actually go and read, the literature on this is actually interesting. People have classified the steps that people have to follow to, to appropriately do data analysis, but you can find both ways if you actually go and are interested in this. Some people say IDA is part of EDA and some people consider it separately. So I'm just saying here that you can find it both ways. So what actually um, is referred to as initial data analysis? So. This is basically what you would do if you want to, for example, pass a test, as you are all having exams right now. You have to study and prepare for it, right? So all of these preparations and studying and you know, getting ready for it can be seen maybe as that, that step when you're doing a project. So you're preparing, you're not doing it yet, but you're preparing everything so it can go smoothly, right? And people have uh, actually um, divided this step in six other mini steps. And this is repeated, you know, across uh, many people <laughs> that, are, that are studying this. The first step, they call it metadata setup. So metadata is data about data, right? So, um, for example, if we're doing a clinical study or any kind of uh, collecting of, of experiments, you need to know, for example, what those experiments were, uh, how the data was generated, what studies have those publications. So that's just the initial metadata setup. Like, where am I getting my data? You know, what do I know about it? Uh, collecting that and put it, in, put it in a readable, readable way, if at all possible. Then, uh, after we have the data, we know where it comes from. We need to do data cleaning. And this is very, very, very important. <laughs> uh, for example, you can realize here that there are certain variables that have missing data. You can realize that you're missing certain data points that you thought were there because maybe the description of the metadata says they should be there, but they're not there. Um, so you have to spend a lot of time just checking that everything looks as you expect. And this is something that Alice just also mentioned for, for uh, uh, the hypothesis-driven research. Data screening is related to data cleaning in a way, but in here you see how your variables are distributed. Are they, is, do they show the expected distributions? For example, I can, I can tell you that um, in data screening, for example, in, in an example from our own lab, um, we, for example, ha uh, work with something called genotyping. Uh, for, for those of you that are not familiar with what genotyping is, basically you can collect a DNA sample and instead of sequencing it, which we saw yesterday, you can do genotyping, which is cheaper, and basically you find the identity of a base every many bases, right? So for example, position, 10 and then position 500 is the next one that you know and this tells you something about the structure of that genome. And that's much cheaper to do. But there's many platforms, again, and many chips as they call them to generate this data. And for example, we have worked with this data and we have, you know, sometimes, oh, you know, it's cheaper for us to do it here and then the next year it changes and you, ch you send it somewhere else. And when you put that data together, in theory it's the same data. Um, you see, for example, bimodal distributions for certain variables, and that should not be the case. They are the same, the, the same pool of people, right? So that's when you realize, oh, there's some technical, you know, difference here. This is being separated by batches, right? So this step, actually, uh, all of these initial data analysis, many authors, and in my own experience as well, takes about 80% of the data, of the time, that you do, that you will do uh, your data analysis. So for my PhD, for was four, four years, for the first three of them, 
I just clean data. <laughs> it sounds, yeah, I know. <laughs> At some point I was like, I will never finish this. This is terrible. But it's normal. I mean, for example, I work with clinical, clinical data and there were many things that happened with clinical data, right? Sometimes patients decided to withdraw from the study. Uh, sometimes doctors were like, actually, sorry, I coded that wrong, change this. And this just, you know, kept evolving and you need to, you know, be taking that into account, reconciling different sources of data, making sure that they're comparable. All of these things take a very long time. So if you're working with data, I just want to say, and if you haven't been able to finish or done, you know, just one experiment to have a conclusion, it's okay. Most of the time will be spent on this. But this is why it's really important that you take this into account and actually do it before you just jump and do tests because otherwise you can be uh, tricked, you know, because you will have this bimodal distribution, you will think there's a difference there when really it's just an artifact. Now it's important that we take a lot of care in this data reporting, initial data reporting. This step is for us, you know, for our lab, for example, our own project. We need to, to uh, really document. Documentation is really important. I know that you've been learning this, in all, uh, probably in all your courses. Uh, but here, some people, and I learned this also the hard way, because I really didn't know. It was like, I'm cleaning data. Like, you're just cleaning data. But no, it's really important to, you know, uh, I found that this variable, you know, had this missing data, and I cannot use it. You record that. Uh, it, you just not remove it and, you know, clean data. It's really important that you have a record of these things because they keep coming back. If you work, in my experience, with clinical records, then you collect more data and then you're like, oh, why did I not put this? And then you put it back and then you realize, like, this happened to me. It's like, so it's important to just have a, re uh, a registry of all the things that you're doing when cleaning, when actually cleaning the data and just making sure that you know, you know, I received it in this state, this is how it looks, I removed this variable because they're not usable uh, or because they don't have the expected distribution. And, or I did adjustments for them to have the expected distribution or adjust, you know, all of these just report it. Then everything that you've just done, of course, will update your plan because maybe you wanted to test a variable that now you've realized after collecting your data, you really, you know, you don't have it or it has a lot of missing data and you cannot really use it. So for that, you will have to update and say, actually, you know, I can't do this, so just remove that from our, from our data analysis. And this is okay because this step is completely independent and it needs to be completely independent from when you are now testing for your hypothesis and trying to find patterns. This does not yet try to find anything. And this is why you can do these adjustments, right? Because you're still not testing for any findings. The problem comes when we start, you know, thinking, oh, I see this correlation, and then this is unconscious, it can happen. You know, you start saying, oh, actually, if I remove this, this is an outlier, probably doesn't count, and we start doing these things, and then we, you know, find a wrong conclusion. So this is important. This needs to be independent from our actual biological, in this case, uh, hypothesis, right? This is just the data. Clean the data, make sure that it looks like it should. When data is complete, your metadata is in order, distributions are what you expect them. And when that, when that is fine, then you can go to the next step. Is that clear? Of course, at the end, you make the final plan when you've done all your cleaning, make your final plan. <laughs> and then it's very good, especially if you work with things like um, clinical uh, trials that you have to document and report before starting the analysis. And we'll see why <laughs> that is important. But any questions here? Is that clear? It's, it's kind of logical, right? Like, it's like, we should do that, but at least no one told me this when I was doing my PhD, and you just like, I have data, I'll analyze it. And you kind of, you know, then find this, oh, you know, that variable didn't really work, and I'm finding this, is this real, it's not real, why is it not real, oh, the data was wrong, that kind of thing, yes? understand exactly the concept of data screening, what mm. you mean by it. Can you repeat? Thank you. Right. So uh, data screening usually refers to seeing how your variables behave, right? So for example, I was making the example of this um, bimodal distribution that we should not see. I mean, when you plot data, 
Uh, and you say, for example, this is an example that is, uh, it did happen to us, it's a bit stupid, to be honest, but for example, the sexes. Uh, usually, in clinical records, I think it has changed recently, but before they were just, they had two options, really, M or F. But sometimes we saw more. <laughs> and, and it's not really that they had the option to select another one, it was just that it was coded differently in the data. So for example, you see four sexes and you're like, well, but what does this mean? And then it's like, oh no. You know, sometimes it's in Spanish and in English and it's you know, <laughs> the other way around. H and M, it means different things. So that is just me seeing, oh, oh, I have to change the coding of this so it agrees. Or, you know, this is not showing the distribution I expected, therefore I need to clean it. Or I need to adjust it or remove it because it really, I cannot use it, right? So really that's looking for your variables and just making sure that they are behaving as you ex expect them, basically. Yeah? So, okay. This is just examples of things that this step can uncover when you um, do it correctly. And many of them have happened to me, <laughs> uh, to our projects, right? So duplicate records, again, when, when working with clinical uh, data and it's updated live, let's say, I mean, on a daily basis because new patients come. Sometimes, for example, it happened to us that the same patient went again to, to you know, see the doctor and the doctor you know, decided to take another sample from them and they accepted, uh, but you know, the doctor, because they see many patients, didn't really realize that they already had sampled this patient and they put it in the, in the database. And at the beginning it looks at, like a different patient because it's a different date and sometimes uh, it's a different age because they come, come, come back you know, two years later and they put that date. So you know, making sure <laughs> you know, the code and you know, what is this patient and why are all these other things the same? Is it the same patient? Oh yeah, it is the same patient, right? So um, sometimes they're not that obvious, the duplicate records, what I wanna say. Um, this, uh, sometimes when you have dichotomous variables with two values, um, zero and one is very common for, but for us it has happened like the sex where it's, it's you know, switched and it's, you know, you think now you see, yeah, I have two sexes, but yeah, they're not really what you expect because someone has coded it one way and someone else has coded it another way. So it's important to take that into account. If you do sequential measurements in your experiments also, uh, inconsistencies in data timestamps can give you problems afterwards. Uh, this is what I was saying, bimodal distributions can indicate inconsistent use of measure measurement units. Uh, we see it in this genotyping data again, not only with things like uh, sex, but al also with you know, the identity of these positions in the genome. Sometimes it's inverted and also you're like, mm, I shouldn't see this. So it's a very, very time consuming step. That's what I want to say. It takes forever, <laughs> years sometimes, but it's worth it. Because otherwise your conclusions will not be valid. And you know, that's all, all, all that you want to uh, get to. Uh, of course, skewed distributions. Um, you may be planning to use a statistical you know, method that you, oh, I wanna use, a, I don't know, a t-test. But if your distributions do not follow the assumptions of the t-test, then you cannot use the t-test, right? So uh, you have to check that as well. Um, things like seeding and floor effects uh, are important when you are studying things like dose-dependent response. So after a certain dose, you know, uh, you cannot really measure anything because the sensibility and the relationship between variables is lost. So you have to also know, for example, on, up until when these results are valid. And then after you pass a certain dose, it's not valid anymore. For example, that's, that's what this refers to. Um, the, cho the choice of statistical models may be invalid, of course, uh, if you do not take into account outliers, which in many cases happen here. Uh, missing data, of course, is important. It can indicate a systematic error in your data collection. It has also happened to us, for example, when we were collecting uh, by different doctors, medical doctors, some of them did not ask the patients certain things, and then when we were collecting, it's like, oh, we're missing a lot of, let's say, age. That's not one, but, you know, just like, what is happening? Oh, it's not really that data is missing for some reasons, just because they didn't ask them. And, and you can track that being like, oh, it's the same person. <laughs> you know, that, that I didn't ask them. So that is important to know, otherwise you may reach, again, a wrong conclusion. And error rates uh, and, and uh, yeah, types of the main variables uh, could indicate a problem 
in the data collection, right? So your data should also be the same type in the same variables, which not always happens when you're collecting from different sources. Uh, so all of these, maybe it sounds logical, but it's important to, I think, have it, you know, consciously think about that because in many cases we just jump <laughs> towards, at least I did it, uh, doing analysis and then we realize it's actually, we're finding all, you know, spurious batch effects and all these things that we have not really taken into account. Do you agree? Is this clear? Okay. Now, I wanted to just show you how this looks like from, you know, in an example from our own lab. Uh, this is data from a student, uh, the name is here, but <laughs> yeah, Irving Simoni, who's a PhD student in our group. And he's doing a, a study about the genetic causes of a rare type of cancer called acrolentigenous melanoma in Mexican patients. Uh, just very briefly, this is the most common type of melanoma in Mexico, in Peru, and in other countries in Latin America, and in Asia and in Africa, but it's uh, understudied because it actually represents a very small proportion of cases in countries like the UK and, and, and the US where traditionally these studies take place, right? So it's understudied, but it is the most common type in certain, uh, let's say, developing countries. So basically what we have here is a genotyping study. As I was telling you about this, like it's not really sequencing, it's just finding um, the identity of a base in the genome every many bases, which is cheaper. And the idea here is that we want to do uh, something called a, a genome-wide association study. Uh, for you, for those of you that do not know what this is, is basically you do this genotyping in many cases with melanoma in this case and many controls, people without melanoma. And you try, it's important to clean the data a lot because you have to make sure that to the best of your ability, the only difference between these two groups is the presence or absence of disease. So you have to try to make sure that they are geographically matched, ethnically matched, Many of these, you know, things that could influence this comparison between cases and controls. And the idea is that if you have done this correctly, then if you see in cases, you know, uh, for example, um, an over-representation of a certain base, of at this position in the genome I have, you know, 50% adenines and the controls only have 30% adenines, then that could be suggestive that that region in the genome increases risk to develop this type of Hello. Ah, okay. No problem. It's fine. Uh, thank you. <laughs> it's okay. Okay. Uh, so basically, this is just a few of these variables, right? That we were talking about. This is the age and uh, the sex and the site where this melanoma occurred. Uh, a characteristic of the type of melanoma is that it's not caused by UV light. Maybe you have heard that melanoma is caused by UV radiation, in this case, this type of melanoma is not caused by UV radiation. So it, it, happen, it, it occurs in places like palms of the hands and soles of the feet and under the nails. So this, for example, you look at this, uh, or we look at this and say, this looks exactly what we expect, right? Because we know in the hospital that, you know, the median age of diagnosis is about 62 years of age. So this more or less represents what we expect. Uh, we have, oh, sorry, this is <laughs> not very informative, labeled your access. <laughs> uh, but uh, more women than men, this is also what we see in the clinic. Uh, and m loads of them from the feet. That's all, that's, that all agrees with what we know of the disease. So we say, okay, this is, seems to be at least from the, for those variables a representative selection. However, uh, I was telling you that we genotyped with two different platforms. One of them at the Sanger Institute here in Orange, and another one in a place called Langevio, which is uh, in Irapuato in Mexico. And these two graphs are showing how many, this is like a matrix, imagine like a matrix of cases of people, individuals, and then positions in the genome, right? So those are your two dimensions. Um, and then you can see how many uh, entries are missing by person, for example, how many positions in the genome they have missing data, and by position, how many people have missing data. 
right? So this is what these two graphs are showing you. And as you can see, the orange one actually has pretty much zero <laughs> missing data. What is happening? Okay. Okay. Hello. Yes, this works. Yes. I'll go and let me just put this on. Okay, yes? Okay. What is missing? The data, really. So for example, if the genotype, if the actual experiment of the genotyping failed at that position for that person, then you have noise. <laughs> you have nothing. You, you cannot determine the identity of the base. So you can see here that for one of the platforms, we have pretty much 0% missing data. So actually, it was very successful. But the other platform, uh, it was not great, right? So some of, and these are the same pool of people, <laughs> really. Uh, we didn't change anything like the DNA extraction method and all of these things. So this tells us, oh, before we jump and try to do here an analysis where maybe we'll find the difference between these two groups, we should probably go back and re-genotype these blue samples. And we did that. And now, you know, it's all fine. So there was a problem with the original experiment. But this is the step that will allow you to realize those things before you jump and do analysis. Right? Is that OK? Yeah? OK. So um, as I was saying, this is just again, it's important that you report this. Many people report, of course, in papers their protocols and what they did afterwards. And that's fine. We have to do that. But it's really important to have a record of what you did before starting the experiment, because as we were talking, all of us have biases, and sometimes we don't realize these biases, right? And, and the only way that we can keep track of what we're doing, and you know, if, if we were biased by some observation in the data, if we, if we have a, rec a record of what we did before starting the analysis, right? So things like um, frequency of missing values in, symbol, in, in single variables, uh, information of shape, of distributions of these variables, um, deletions, if you, if you deleted some variables because you could not use them, you also should record that. Uh, and basically, yes, just, just have a, a written record of that. And this paper <laughs> is interesting because it illustrates this point, I think. Uh, in this paper, these people uh, basically took, as I was saying, clinical trials are required to register what they're going to do before actually doing uh, the, the trial because these, uh, if they don't, you know, you could, they could have done anyway, a anything and, and they could have, you know, just be biased by the data that they saw and the patterns and report something that they have not hypothesized since the beginning, right? So they are always required to do this. So these people studied um, basically 122 uh, clinical trials that were registered and then what actually, you know, they did the experiment and what did they report at the end? And they found basically that 62% of these trials uh, had at least one primary outcome that was changed. So they actually changed the original plan along, you know, because they saw something interesting, maybe. And they were like, oh, oh, we should report that, even though it was not in their original plan. And in theory, this is not bad in the sense that maybe you're spotting an interesting pattern, but this is not proven yet because you still need another step to test and confirm those results. Um, but in these reports, of course, it's just the result of the clinical trial. So they should not change that. So 62 had uh, at least one primary outcome that was changed. They introduced a new one or they just removed it, right? Uh, and they also went and asked the original people, like, did you change it? And most of them said no, <laughs> despite, as it says here, clear evidence to the contrary. And it's not that these people are lying. This is a thing, right? Or at least not most of them, I would think. It's just because we, are, we have biases and we're like, no, no, I mean, I did what I said. And look, this is a beautiful analysis of my data and it's telling me all of this, but this was not your plan. And I mean, I, I, I cannot blame them in the sense of this happens to all of us, but this is why it's very important to have a record of your original plan, right? Because otherwise you will be just, you know, uh, fooled you know, by correlations and things that you can see 
in your data. Any questions up until here? I don't know, what time is it? Okay, that's fine, we have lots of time. But, yeah, good, no questions? Okay, uh, now we go to EDA, and it's very similar, actually, to IDA, as I was saying, some people consider it to be the same. Uh, but here, you are now going a little bit further, at least this is why, uh, how I see it. Because now you're now looking at your clean data, and now you can start suggesting hypotheses about, about the causes of observed phenomena. Right? You can assess the assumptions, uh, decide what statistical test you're going to use, what is appropriate. Um, and also, if you decide that you need more data, because sometimes that's the result of your data, uh, initial data analysis plan, like I do not have enough power to do this, I need more data, you can also uh, know which kind of data you need. For example, this is a maybe a stupid example, but if you only collected men for a certain study, like, well, I actually need women, <laughs> right? But I know now that I need that, right? So this is what ADA then uh, can do. And, and it uses another set of tools, for example, clustering and dimension reduction techniques. Have you seen this in one of some of your, you know, things like PCA and, yeah? You've, you know what this is? Uh, and, and this, of course, you can, you can try and observe, uh, you know, the, pattern, the, the patterns of data, high dimensional data. Uh, we can see also visualization of each, each uh, uh, variable. Um, and basically, you now we're trying to understand the interactions and the correlations between our different fields in our data. Okay, and uh, this is just continuing to the same example I, I was telling you about for this project. Uh, here, Irving, a PhD student, uh, now plotted the, five, the first five principal components in uh, cases and controls. So you can see here, it's very small, but controls are in blue and cases are in orange. And basically what we're trying to make sure here is that cases and controls overlap. Because if they, again, separate, this is not... <laughs> I mean, this, in this case, this separation is based on the genome. And we know that all these people are Mexican, so they should mostly, <laughs> or really, <laughs> completely overlap. Of course, there's a lot of heterogeneity in Mexico, that's another separate issue, but on the majority, they should overlap. But as you can see here, for example, there's a little tail here of, of controls that are not matched by any cases. And this kind of analysis then makes, uh, allows you to realize, actually, what is that? Maybe I should remove that from my controls because they're not matched and I will be, fi be finding, you know, another thing that is an effect of geographical and ethnicity instead of the disease, right? And um, this is just another graph. There's many of these graphs again. <laughs> this takes a very long time, uh, but this is also the fraction, um, the fra the, how do you say, uh, each, each position in the genome has something called an allele frequency. So, you know, for example, if it's an A and a G found at that, at that position, uh, sometimes you have 70% A, 30% G. That's the allele, allelic frequency. So most of them should match between catches and controls. Of course, the objective of this is find differences in there, but the majority of them should match because your hypothesis is that the majority of them are not related to the disease. But in, in some cases, you see again the little tails here. So this is just telling you maybe I should remove some controls because they're not matched, you know? And I, if I include them, I will find things that are not real. So the conclusion for the, uh, the EDA and e IDA and EDA steps. Mariana, could you remove, sorry, the... Um, right now is that data has been cleaned now to only include samples that do not have missing data by regenotyping, for example, and the samples that failed are removed. That the data is distributed according to what we expect across different variables, as I showed you before. Um, cases and controls have been now filtered to be comparable by ancestry, which is what these graphs will allow us. And I'm not showing you here, but we also, of course, did a statistical power um, calculation to try and see what can we detect. This is important, because sometimes you do a test and if you don't find anything, and you say, oh, maybe there's no effect, but you really didn't have enough power since the beginning, right? This is something you have to take into account. So we know, for example, that with our sample size, we can only detect effect sizes that are called 1.4 or higher, which is actually quite high. It's probably going to fail, but it's the best we, at least we know, it's the best we can do at the moment. Um, and uh, we know that we need to increase sample size, and now we know which samples we need to increase sample size. So now, in theory, we can start 
our statistical analysis plan. Now we know all of this, right? Is that good, clear? Okay, so now we go to the next step, the final step, which is uh, now doing our statistical analysis plan. Now, now that you know your data, maybe it took you 80% of your time, <laughs> maybe it took you three years like it took me for my PhD data, but now you know, you have your data, you have cleaned it, you have frozen it, you have said this is it. Now, of course, the main question is what is that I'm interested in, right? How do, how do the, like, the data look like? What was the result of the steps I just did? And with that answer, what are the most appropriate tools for my statistical analysis? Right? So um, I just took this uh, from a book. Uh, this is a frequentist approach to statistics. Um, and there are, again, many, many different uh, choices that you can uh, take when deciding what to test, how to test it. Uh, and you have to be very careful that your data does follow all the assumptions that each of these different tests actually um, I mean, this is, you know, if you're testing groups, what do you want to uh, test? If it's a difference in means, uh, if it's uh, invariances, all of these things, you have to be very, very careful. Now, have you seen these comics, XKCD? XKCD, you're familiar with them? Sorry, I now have a lot of comics because I love these guys and I think they illustrate very well this point. Okay, so some considerations here is that we have to be very, very careful of inferring causation when there's only correlation, right? So this happens a lot in many places. Of course, I've done it too, because it's something that you keep training and you keep you know, learning how to do uh, during your formation. But if you see variables that are correlated, that doesn't really mean that one causes the other or that they have a, a, a similar cause. You know, it can be many other things that, you know, they're just, there's many examples, maybe you've seen them of like um, ice cream sales and pirate deaths or something like that, it's like, uh, it's, it follows the same pattern, I think it has to do with the summer, something to do with like, you know, summer increases, uh, both uh, ice cream sales and pirate fights or something like that, but you know, that means they're not connected, right? So you have to be very careful with that. Uh, also, it's interesting and Im very, very important to know which analysis methodology you are using. So I think, at least for my case, maybe it's different for you guys that are much younger, but in my case, when I learned statistics, I only learned the frequentist approach to statistics. Um, and my world opened when I saw that there was Bayesian approaches to statistics, right? Uh, and this comic, I will take some time, so please read it. This comic illustrates exactly why these approaches are different and will give you completely different results. Do you understand why, why, why there's this difference in the, in the result? Who's familiar with frequentist and Bayesian statistics? Who can tell me why one says, yes, I conclude the sun has exploded, and the one says, no, it hasn't. Anyone? No? <laughs> What's up, Adam Nielsen? You look at me like, One is smarter. <laughs> oh, my, my student Irving, who's a Bayesian statistician, would say the same. <laughs> no, it's uh, um, actually we will discuss this, and not, maybe not today. I mean, between today and tomorrow, this this approach, this approach Bayesian statistics, because um, many people consider it to be better at uh, answering really what a qu uh, the question that a researcher has when they do a statistical test. And we'll see that. But basically, the difference here, at least in this panel, is that um, the Bayesian statistician takes into account something called the prior probability of an event. And given all the evidence that we have, the sun hasn't exploded in a very long time and doesn't show any signs of having done so, right? So uh, this person says the prior is so strong that this has not happened and it has such a small probability of it happening 
that it, I don't care really what this thing tells me, all my evidence is that this has not exploded, right? Whereas the frequency statistician says, oh, I just take this information, calculate it, have a p-value, which we will discuss, and decide to reject the hypothesis, right? My no hypothesis. Yes, is that clear, more or less? Uh, these, these things about statistics are very, very, very complicated. Um, but it's good just so you know that there are different approaches to doing it. And it's important, as this comic again illustrates, that if you choose one approach or another approach, you will come to completely different, you may come to completely different uh, conclusions on your data. So that is important. <laughs> another one, I told you, I had less of them. Um, but also, another big problem, at least in genomics, but in any big data field, is a multiple testing problem. So, for example, in this example I told you about genotyping, we're trying to find which of these variants in the genome are associated to a disease. So what do we do? It's a statistical test per variant, right? So we're testing, I think a chip has something like 1.5 million SNPs that it, that it uh, uh, assesses. So if we have 1.5 million tests, some of them will come positive just because that's the nature of statistics. And that doesn't mean that it's a real association. Right, so um, this, what this comic illustrates again uh, very nicely is that uh, if we separate the data, for example, and we do many, 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 many tests, in this case, such a ridiculous hypothesis as uh, jelly beans linked to acne, but we separate by colors, one of them will come positive because in theory, if we do 20 tests and we have 0.05, we expect that one of them will come positive, you know, but it, it's a, fa it's a fa false positive result. But then, you know, the news comes in, oh, you know, we take that result and then we, if this had been corrected, then this would not have happened, right? So you see, you see the, the problem with this or the, the point. Yeah, any questions so far? No? Okay. <sighs> okay, so now, now we come to, <laughs> to, to the difficult part, at least for me and I think for many people too, given the discussions I see everywhere, the elephant in the room is the p-value. So who's used to p-value here before? P-values. Ah, lots of you. Now who can tell me what a p-value is? I don't know how to explain statistically, but what I know is that p-value tells you if your new hypothesis is correct. It's agree with your new hypothesis or not. For example, if the p-value is smaller than uh, 0 0.05, you usually say, oh, these groups are different, statistically different. And true. if it's, it's bigger, you say, oh, the groups are equal, something like this. This is true, this is how people use it, absolutely. Yes. Uh, more, <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, yeah, uh, as I remember, it's something like uh, the, p the p value is the probability of getting a, a result that is um, equal or at least, yeah, it's equal or bigger than um, the result you would expect if your null hypothesis was correct. That is a book definition, indeed. Um, that's right. Uh, you wanted to say something else? The same thing? Uh, someone over here? I just wanted to say something that is like, um, you cannot say that uh, things are exactly the same, so you measure how different they are. And if they are different enough, you can say you have a different result, or, uh, but you have a limit alpha. So your, uh, your analysis of it will depend on what you define as limit. So that's um, a bit arbitrary. You mean for the, for the 0.05? Yeah, that's just a, a convention. Uh, no, indeed. I mean, that is, that is what a p-value is. Uh, and this is, I took it from Wikipedia because I think it's a very, I mean, it's, it's the definition of a p-value. And it's, it's exactly, sorry, what's your name? Julia. Julia, as Julia said. Uh, in null hypothesis significance testing, 
The p-value is a probability of obtaining test results at least as extreme as the result actually observed under the assumption that the null hypothesis is correct. So maybe um, that is something we can understand. Yes? Ah, uh, right. Well, this, yes, we will discuss this again. So, yeah, so you don't understand. Me neither. No, we'll, we'll discuss that. Uh, we'll see. We will discuss this. Uh, I want to try to interpret that and you tell me if it is correct. Because the p value is also like uh, the observed correlation, is the probability of the, the observed correlation is due to randomness. Maybe. Randomness is that's your null hypothesis in theory. That's, that's the main, my null hypothesis. So. It's probably observing your result. Yes. I mean, it, how compatible is that with randomness if that's your null yes. hypothesis? Yes. Yes, that is the definition. But as uh, your name, your name, please. Beatrice. Beatrice. Yes, you did tell me that before. Sorry. <laughs> yes. Let's let's walk. Let's let's draw things. Uh, because it's really hard to understand. It's it's it seemingly seems like. You know, I can understand that on a higher level. But when you get into it, it's, it's not really telling people what they, you know, what, what, what we think it's telling us. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll switch to Mariana yeah. so she'll so draw graphs. Th this is going to be a very, very simple diagram. But I think, an, uh, uh, yeah, good point. Thanks. Ah, yes. Uh, uh, sorry. Good. So, yeah. I will. Um, this is a very simple diagram, but it helps me a lot. And hopefully, a few of you are also like more on the uh, quantitative visual thinking. And, and just for me, like looking at definitions like that just doesn't do it for my brain. So, um, basically, and, and we will be building as Daniela goes with other concepts. But one way to see the world is just see it as distributions, right? So once you start with a, a null, well, not a null hypothesis, any hypothesis, you have a hypothesis about the world that it can be described as a distribution. Of course, this is a simplification because we are thinking of only one dimension and things can be more complicated than that. But we don't care for the purpose of just describing this, is that we assume something is true and that something is described by a distribution, right? So this distribution is gonna have different properties we don't particularly care about, but uh, the, the one we always kind of associate is you're going to have a mean, and I'm going to put these uh, names here just because it's going to help us later. But basically, you have a mean value. We are going to call it mu, nu, because this represents our null hypothesis. So basically, you're just going to say, this is what I expect to see if this is true. I'm going to, like, if I, I make a, a draw or a test or an observation, it doesn't matter. Most of them are going to fall around my mu value. Some of them are going to fall far away. You can also measure, like, the variance, and that tells you how um, much of this dispersion you expect. All those are, like, things from statistics. But thinking about the p-value, basically, you are going to say, I'm going to uh, just going to look at the extreme values. So I'm going to say, what is the probability that I have an observation on one extreme? And if I say the, the probability of finding an observation this extreme is um, less or equal than 0 0.05, and when you do, and I'm not going to get to the other concepts until she gets there, but basically, if your observation is here, you say in, in whatever is this area, that's why uh, I think Julia was saying like uh, at least that weirdness of observation um, that basically says, well, then I can say that with a p-value of 0 0.05 or whatever, right? Like maybe here you're already in uh, 0 0, uh, 0.01. That is the p-value that uh, that observation is coming from your null distribution. So it's smaller means it becomes more and more weird, but you are still not saying anything, and I think that's gonna come up, right? You're still, oh, Daniel is ignoring me. <laughs> You're still not saying anything about, um, anyway, doesn't matter, I'm getting away. Is, is this helping? Yeah. Okay, I don't want to get ahead of uh, the other concepts Daniela is gonna show. But okay, so now in this view, yeah, you get, well, yes, you get what the p-value is. The, area under the curve of your distribution of the null hypothesis and where your value fell and you take that and the more extreme right thanks Boyle, for the um for for the yes 
Uh, I, I didn't understand what this is the distribution of what? For, for example, I have two samples I want to test if they are significantly different. What would mm. be this, this plot? Samples meaning you can test two groups and the means, maybe? Is yeah, exactly. Yeah. You okay. can, in this case, you're trying to, de to define uh, the mean of one population. Okay. Um, and here you try to approximate it. Well, maybe you would approximate it by um, an average. But if you do this many, many times, uh, I'll see an example of this actually. But if you draw different samples from this population and you calculate the averages, some of them may fall around here. And you may do a hypothesis testing of this kind to try and see, you know, does that approximate this distribution? And in some of cases, it may fall on that side, and many of the cases it will fall in the middle side. Um, uh, maybe that confused you more. Okay, <laughs> but what am I say about these populations that that fall in the tail? For example, I have several populations, and you are comparing with the mean. That's that me zero, uh, and some of these populations will go to this side here. What this means? This means that this population is different from others. I, I didn't understand. Ah. Sorry, so that's, that's uh, well, if I'm understanding correctly and cor uh, correct me otherwise, that, that's exactly the point. Let's assume this is true. This is the distribution of your observation. And we can think about, uh, you know, like something as uh, flipping a coin, right? You can do it. And if you do it enough time, like I'm going to flip uh, five coins and look at what I get, and I'm going to do it again and look what I get. So if you do it enough times, a few of those are going to give you all heads or all crosses, right? Those are the weird ones. You don't expect them to happen as often, but they still happen. They are still possible. So if this is the real distribution of whatever is my phenomena, biological, physical, uh, toy experiment, it doesn't matter. If this is the true distribution, I still expect to find this, just with a small probability. So what uh, you are trying to do with these p-values, and that's important to keep in mind, is to say, well, yeah, this is possible, but not very probable. So I'm going to believe in it, or I'm going to say, like, I don't believe actually in the, in the null hypothesis because it is not the most probable thing to be behind. My alternative hypothesis might be more probable. And for that, it's actually really important to start thinking about what is the other distribution that is going to be here. But again, like I'm, uh, we are not going to talk about this until she moves a little up. But the p-value, the, and that's why the p-value fails sometimes, because it's just telling you that it is not very probable to find it from the null distribution. But it still matters how probable it is to find it from your alternative distribution, right? Because as I say, if you do it with coins, you are going to find sometimes all heads. Uh, it doesn't mean that the coin is not fair or there is not a state, right? So two states. And you can uh, be, you, your, your sample can be, you know, just drawn and you have bad luck. And your, it does come from the distribution, but as Mariana was saying, you have all heads and you then will be led to believe that that sample actually did not come from this distribution, but it did, right? So uh, actually that's what we're going to see now. Uh, so far. Is the definition of what a people, we're going to get into why it's so problematic. Ah, yes, go. So I don't know anything about p-values, but I think isn't, like, isn't that the definition of a statistically significant event, which is something different ah, from the p-value? Well, that's right. I was talking like here with Kawila. That to me seems like the definition of what the statisticians usually call alpha value, right? True. The that's the alpha value. That's ah, right. Well, okay. the alpha value is this this line and you uh -huh. can put it at 0 0.05 okay People and, and, and the p-value is like the actual observed the p-value is the area under the curve yeah you find your um, you're gonna find a value mm -hmm. and you're gonna say the p-value is like the sum of wherever like uh, you found your observation point and much more extreme and you're right uh, the point okay. five is usually like a standard alpha 
alpha, and you say your p-value is significative wherever it comes after that alpha. Okay, so basically I have like an expected distribution. I have this yellow actual distribution, which I observe. This is not the actual, this is the alternative. Uh -huh. So in hypothesis uh, testing, Okay, so I just have, have two the theories, right? Uh, yeah, so first just the p-value would be, let, let's just look at the, at the, at the white one. The p-value would just be, what is the probability that I get this observation that I'm doing uh, if the null hypothesis was correct, right? So if I'm here, if I'm here, then you're like, I mean, very probable, right? Cool. P-value, super high. The area is massive, right? But if you start getting to the extremes of the distribution, then in theory, in theory, <laughs> what the p-value is trying to do is telling you, well, actually, the probability is so small that your observation came from this distribution that you can choose to do something about that. You can choose to say it didn't come from that distribution, and that's what is called rejecting the null hypothesis, meaning this is not right because my sample is telling me something else. Not yet getting into many cases when you do that, you have an H1. So this is called the H0, meaning the null distribution. But you, in many cases, assume that um, your, uh, re, your, your alternative, which is what she was saying, the, not the null, but your hypothesis is that is, for example, lower, right? So, so your distribution actually, it's this one, I hypothesize. So in that case, you uh, can, you know, how much they overlap, these two, and you can say, actually, you know, if my observation is here, uh, then it's very, uh, the probability that it came from the white one is very small, but the probability that it came from the yellow one is higher, therefore, they say, people say, I reject the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative hypothesis, uh, which is a not, you know, and sometimes you don't have alternative in that, well, you have an alternative, but it's not here. You say, I, I don't know what the difference is. And in that case, you divide your alpha in the two extremes because you don't know if it's lower or higher. And you say 0 0.025 here, 0 0.025 here. That gives me my alpha of 0 0.5. You know, that's the area under the curve. And uh, that's how I do it. And, but it's very confusing. Again, <laughs> this, is, this is confusing. And, and we'll see now. But for just the definition, just the, right, the white distribution, p-value, is that clear what it means? You know, it's just where your observation fa fail under what you assumed was the null. I yeah? feel very lost. So, uh, um, <laughs> me I'm too. Go I'm <laughs> going to say what I, what I think I understood go on. And, and try to explain what I do not understand. Uh -huh. uh, uh, so the p-value, the whatever will be this, will be a number, a positive number, which is mm -hmm. the result of the improper integral from the value uh, from from the value you're considering to the to the closest extreme uh, to that value. So if it were for if if that uh, vertical line you did was in the positive x in the positive side, you'd consider the improper integral to the right. You always consider the more extreme. So that's yeah, but the in idea. that yeah. ah, you mean. But in that case, you have to, like, it, it seems that it is as improbable for, for it to be a very negative number like as it is to be a, a very... You mean here? Yes. Yes, you can do that. That's called two-sided hypothesis testing. Uh, you can, you, it, 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 you have to define, when you, when you do this, you have to define, are you doing one tail or two tails? That's, or one side, two sides. If you have an uh, alternative hypothesis saying, I think my sample actually comes from a distribution that has a lower mean or something, then you have alternative. And then you can kind of compare these two. But sometimes you don't. Sometimes you say, did they come from this distribution? I don't know which side. In that case, actually, yes, you also take into account this, this so, thing. So if you did not have those, uh, another, this, another probability, and you, and you got a value, a positive value, like away from the mean, or right at the right of the mean, uh, you'd get a very high p-value, and then you say, oh, it's very probable, um, but if you get the probability distribution, it, they may be in the same horizontal line. So um, I'm confused. And besides that, I, I haven't understood yet what is a null hypothesis. Yeah, is that the hypothesis for the probability distribution of the experiment you're going to do? Okay, so yeah, maybe, maybe I can uh, help it. Again, like if I'm understanding correctly. Thank you. <laughs> um, so... All these things
things come always. Uh, as I think everything Daniela has said, and I think is true in basically all fields of science. You have to very, very clearly define what is your question before looking at any of these things, right? So p-value, null hypothesis, all these things are like very vague general terms that we use, like slightly different depending what you're doing, and they are only meaningful on the on the context of your question, right? So null hypothesis is as kind of Daniela say, she was explaining something else, but uh, related to this is what you want to reject. When you're working with these things, you always start with something that will be the trivial answer, but that you think is not true, right? Like in the case of uh, the uh, data that Daniela is working with and she was showing, uh, basically the null hypothesis would be that there is no genetic markers for the disease, right? That genetically everybody is the same. And it is possible, because it might not be a genetic disease, but it's not what they believe, right? They believe there is something. So if there is no disease, then you will expect that everybody, healthy and sick people, will have the same distribution of whatever, right? This is just a drawing because actually that is multidimensional. You have many, many dimensions. And you have to work with analyzing the data to make it, you know, like in a framework that you can actually work with. But the idea is exactly the same you have a distribution. Now, with thinking about the tails, as uh, you were saying, like maybe you're thinking here and you will say your p-value is all this, but um, you don't do it that way because you always build this already thinking about your, your uh, experiment, your problem, right? So in general, you already kind of know if, uh, for instance, you're just looking at difference on transcriptional or gene expression it, I, I, I don't care if the disease is making me having higher expression or lower expression. I don't care. The only thing I care is that it is different between healthy and people with the disease, right? So you will do the two tail. Like I don't care if it is here or it is here. And as Daniela was saying, just to make it fair with other experiments, you will put the point 0 0.025 here and you will put the point 0 0.025 here as your uh, threshold to the side. If, for instance, um, it is not about the, or my null hypothesis is that this gene is overexpressed in the disease, right? I am already putting a sign on it, then I will only look to the high values because I'm saying it's overexpressed, right? And then you will cut this way. And other than that, you're right. Like I, once you're thinking about the distribution, the only thing that matters is what is the value of the probability. So we only care about this. And this is just the dimension that you're looking at. Was it helpful or not really? Maybe with okay. a coin toss thing, would that help if it's a biased coin? Come on, come on. Maybe it would, I'm just thinking about how to maybe explain this thing. Oh, well, before you let go now. No, it's good. Sí. Sorry. No, una de, de coin toss, o sea, de si está biased or no. No sé, olvidarlo. That's fine. We're just thinking about how to explain these things. Uh, Ruth. Uh, can I interpret it like uh, the probability of making a mistake rejecting H, the null hypothesis? That is a type 2 error? I never yes, remember the like names. Yes, like an error. Type 1, type Probability two. of making a mistake if I reject the null hypothesis. Yes. that. Go and draw the so things. The, <laughs> yes. That's what the alpha is saying. Yes. The, when you decide, like, I'm, this is going to be my threshold, mm -hmm. whatever is under that threshold, I will reject the null hypothesis. Mm -hmm. Actually, that threshold is telling you the probability of rejecting something that is true. Yes. Because that is telling you the probability that even if that was the real distribution, you are still going to find it. And again, like, at least for me, thinking of the simple, simple flip of a coin is what helps, right? Like you will say, uh, my uh, null hypothesis is that the coin has a tail and a head. Um, and my alternative hypothesis is that everything is just uh, tails, right? Like that is a very extreme, absurd example. But that is enough to think about it. Like for any chance I do my experiment and I find five tails. And I say, well, no, then the coin has only one uh, both sides are tails, I cannot recognize. Well, I'm gonna have a probability I cannot calculate in my head. I guess two to the five, blah, 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 that actually no. That was still a coin with the two sides. 
It's just that I'm, 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 I don't know. And as you make it, you know, like more, the experiment bigger, then it's less probable that you are gonna find that, and you start like reducing the probability of your error one that will be like a, a, a false uh, positive, right? A there is a drawing that we can also share, the, the one that has the power, the beta, yeah, the... Yeah, we're gonna say those things here. I don't yeah, think I have it there. But it doesn't matter, it helps illustrate all of these types of error and how they depend really on how, you know, overlapping these things are, your alpha threshold that you set. All of these things are related and very hard. Again, this is hard to understand. It's definitely not easy. And in many cases, it's telling people it's not telling people actually what they think it's telling them. And we're going to see some examples of that. But so far, uh, we have 15 minutes. I would like to maybe finish today's mm, lecture. I only have like four more slides. But I'd like to uh, just make sure that just the simple definition of a p-value is we'll get into more, even more trouble. We will. But so far, you know, we only need one distribution, which we assume is the null. And in this case, as Mariana was saying, for example, in our experiment that I was explaining to you earlier, that I told you we do a statistical test per, um, per uh, uh, SNP or per gene position, the null hypothesis is there is no association between the SNP and the disease. And I do this test a million, of t a million times and, you know, I see it falls here, here, here. And then some cases one falls here, right? And in that case, if we don't correct for multiple testing, as I showed you in this slide before, then we can also fall uh, into errors. But uh, more or less, is a p-value, I mean, the, just a definition of what a p-value is, more or less clear? I guess, I uh, like, something that I think is super important that is clear from this visualization and from understanding p-value is, p-value is never telling you that the null hypothesis is not true. It's just telling you that it's not very probable, right? Never that is not true, because that's, I think, the most common error that people over-interpret uh, p-values as, oh, then it cannot be, no. Like, you can see from this draw, draw and uh, like also just thinking about the coins, it always is possible that it comes from this. Uh, it's just not very probable. That's right, and that's what we were saying at the beginning, that many people say in papers, look, my p-value is small, therefore, there's a difference. I mean, it could still come from the same distribution, right? This is, this is, this is what I what I like you guys to take into account. The p-value actually was um, thought by uh, Fisher in the 1920s, I think it was, as just a complementary approach to all the other evidence that you can gather for your experiment, right? But he has because it was easy to calculate, because the calculation of it is, you know, there's formulas, it's kind of easy, um, and it's a number, and it reduces everything to just one number. Uh, people started misusing it because it was, you know, simple and, and easy. Uh, and, and it has become something, you know, where you see papers where they just like, there's a small p-value, therefore, you know, I conclude there's a difference, and that's it. I move on to the next thing. And that's not correct, actually. Uh, so if we continue with this slide, don't worry, we will. Uh, it's not too, too much. I know it's very confusing. Don't worry. It is very, it, even for me, I have used p-values for many, many years, and it's still very confusing. Like, what exactly is it telling me again? Uh, we, we are also, we are going to use this again. Like, we have the, the I cannot say the last name. Ah, Ioannidis. <laughs> we have an activity with that author that I cannot pronounce his Ioannidis. name. Ioannidis. Um, that I think it's also going to help you to kind of, you know, get this, this really solid. So don't worry too much. Just try to follow the big picture and we can, you know, get over this idea as the course continues. Yes. So, okay, we were discussing what problems are there with the p-value? Many of them. The first one, oh, well, this is, this is a, provocative, a provocative graph. Uh, and the truth is a p-value measures the compatibility of a sample with a hypothesis not the truth of the hypothesis. So your hypothesis can be anything because you state it. But if it was actually very improbable in the beginning, and if you get a small p-value, you cannot conclude this. I reject the null hypothesis in favor of the, of the, of the um, uh, alternative. 
it's more probable that it was just, again, a fluke. You know, it was just a sample from this side of the distribution. So um, this graph, and I can, we can share all these papers where these graphs are because I think it's useful to read about them. Basically, it's just telling us many people, if you have used p-values, they just, ah, do statistical tests, whatever, t-testing, whatever, p-value, yeah, yeah, woo, yeah, that's it. Um, but actually, if your if you're, uh, alternative hypothesis is very improbable since the beginning, the fact that you get a small p-value only increases the, the likelihood of that hypothesis by a little bit. So in this case, for example, if it was very improbable, uh, 19 to 1 odds against, you know, your p-value of 0.01, which in theory people would say, oh, this is a small p-value, it's still more probable <laughs> that the new hypothesis is true, right? So, and this is a very hard concept to grasp because um, when we do this kind of testing, frequentist statistics do this, does this, as the comic we saw before, uh, it doesn't allow our method or the framework doesn't allow us to assess the probability of a hypothesis being true. It just assumes it's either true or false, right? And that's not the real question that a, that a, that a researcher has. And actually, I think this is what it says here. Um, a p-value measures whether a observed result can be attributed to chance. In this case, they're assuming the new hypothesis is chance. But it cannot answer a researcher's real question, what are the odds that a hypothesis is correct? Bayesian statistics helps with this approach, right? And we can share some um, reading materials about that. But when I saw this, actually I have this in my office, like put there because I really didn't know this when I was like growing up in science. I just thought, you know, oh, it's very improbable and then the null hypothesis, that must mean that what I'm thinking is correct, you know, I reject and go. But actually, it's still very unlikely in some cases, right? So just, it's the same number as you see, 0 0.05, 0 0.01, 0 0.05, 0 0.01 but it actually means many, many, many different things. And we cannot take this into account in just a traditional uh, hypothesis testing p-value uh, thing. Now, also, the p-value is unstable and can yield irreproducible results. Now, this is easy to see, I think, because in, in this simulation, we can also uh, give you this paper, uh, these people, these authors, have just taken two distributions, A and B, they call them, and the distributions, because they define them, they know that they have a difference in mean of 0.5. That's the real difference. Now, if you take samples many times from those distributions and try to estimate what this difference is, as you can see, well, sometimes your p-value will be very small and you will estimate an, an effect size, you know, that is much bigger than the original. And so in many cases, you will just not find any difference in this case, of course. Smaller sample size are more unreliable for these kinds of studies. But as you can see, these are the same two distributions. It's the same problem. And they're just taking different samples to compare. And this is what we do when we do our experiments. We have a sample of a distribution. And we do one of these tests usually. If we can have replicates, that's good. But in many cases, we can't because it's clinical record. You know, other things that are not that easy to replicate in this traditional sense. So if we have one sample, we're comparing samples from you know, it's the same distribution. We have to be aware that if your p-value is like this small, it's still just one, you know, one test. And if I do it again, and I take new people from the same distribution, it may completely fail. And this has happened a lot of, uh, in papers in psychology. They are, um, there were many, this was another reproducibility crisis. We will talk about this in another future lesson. Um, but basically, this, this is what gets published. Right, and, and, and that was a crisis also in cancer, but it started, I think, in, in the field of psychology, where people they said, we're gonna reproduce this, and took another sample, and then the p-value disappeared, you know, the significant p-value. It's like, what happened? Well, you, 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 you published this, this experiment, but you didn't publish all these experiments, right? So we have to be very conscious of that. This is a graph from the same paper, again, uh, just uh, showing that as we have more, uh, a bigger sample size, as our intuition uh, says, it will approximate, of course, uh, the correct result. The power will increase for the test. Uh, and I, again, as I, I told you before, these distributions that they're simulating have a real difference of 0.5. But if you take 10, 10 uh, samples from each distribution and you test, and you take the 0.05 traditionally taken as, you know, significant, uh, you take it in many cases here, as you can see, it will just 
not find it. Here I think it's just 18% of the tests will show a difference and there is a difference, but you know, here just 18%, 48, so it's increasing, of course, uh, with sample size, but in many cases we cannot have a, such a big sample size. In our study that I was telling you, our effect size that we can detect is actually only very big effect sizes, but it's, it's, in, it's, we ca it's not easy to increase the sample size because it's a rare disease, right? So sometimes you cannot increase your sample size that easily, and you at least have to be aware, you know, what does this mean, How, what can I find, right, with my sample size and my assumptions. And, well, because of all these problems, there's a massive um, issue in scientific literature that's called p-hacking, p-value hacking. And this means people try many different things until they get a p-value that works, and that's what they publish. And then, that is why we have a reproducibility crisis in science at the moment, right? Because people only publish the um, positive results and all of the other tests that are done are just, you know, buried because journals are not interested in that. Careers are not built on negative results, right? So um, uh, it's funny because, uh, well, <laughs> again, I just use this guy's XKCD for all, all my slides because they're very good. But basically, uh, yes, this is usually what people do. They, they put names into, you know, whatever uh, 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 values they get, highly suggestive, and then, this is a real thing. If you go to this webpage, this guy, Matthew Hankins, has collected real papers of, you know, how people start calling p-values, you know. They are, they are starting attributing meanings to them, right? So this means nothing. Like, again, because of what we've seen, all of these things are real, are published in the scientific literature. And they mean nothing, right? <laughs> so uh, this, yeah, this guy, and his page is called, of course, still not significant. Um, uh, you, can, you can take a look, but this is a real, I mean, it's funny because, you know, people choose these words, but it's a real problem, right, if, 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 you, if you look at it uh, this way. Okay, so just to finish today's class that, you know, it's hard, what do we do? Well, do not assume a p-value is fi it's a final answer. It's good to calculate it because in the end it, it is testing, you know, the compatibility of your data with a set hypothesis that you have. But of course you need much more evidence than just that to conclude something, right? So it's not a final answer, it's part of the process as it was originally intended when it was uh, stated. Now, now, it's also very important to report other things because in many papers you will see p-value is small, yeah, difference by well, how big is the difference, right? So sometimes the difference is so tiny that for example in medicine it really doesn't matter. Like it's like how is this affecting you know what, the practical value of this result is nothing, right? So for that, we should also report, along with the p-value, other uh, also useful measures such as calculated effect size, that's how big the difference really is, and the confidence interval, right? So that depends also on your sample size. You know, I think the real difference is between these two values. And of course, it's important to plot and show all of our data points, because if we only show means or medians, then, you know, we can deceive ourselves as well. Now finally, so other statistical considerations and a recap of today. Um, well, if you can, it sometimes is difficult because uh, in a calculation of a power statistical test, it's very complicated and it takes many things into account. But if possible, uh, try to calculate how powerful your test is. Because in many cases we do a test, we don't find a difference, which may, and then we say, there's no difference. And it just meant that, you know, it could be that our power was, our, our test was not, did not have power. As we saw, oh, sorry, as we saw here, just very quickly here, this test has no power. Like there is a real difference, but what 84, 82% of the tests are telling me uh, there's not a difference, right? So uh, you have to try and assess how powered uh, your test is. I just wanted to add something here because I think uh, that's, that's uh, what, we wanted to explain with this and I think we never kind of fully incorporated, right? The power actually will come a lot with what are your distribution here. It will come with how probable do you think this or like uh, overlap, this will be your other type of error, your error uh, of having a false negative. And actually power is just in general, oh yeah, we need to change this or people. 
Uh, not here. Cannot. Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> so um, this will be your false negative, and people in general call power um, simply. Uh, this is called beta uh, by the standard, and power is simply one minus beta. So basically, everything that is here. So one thing is your null distribution, and the other thing is when you decide it is not probable enough uh, to come from here. And the other um, thing would be your actual power. The power is much, I mean, they are related because you are cutting in the same place. So to this side in the null distribution, you get alpha. From this side in your alternative distribution, you get beta, but they are connected by the threshold you choose. But regardless of how small you measure your p-value, how small you make this, what is your null distribution, the power is much more related to this. And this distribution, that is your alternative distribution, it will be you know, the, the actual thing that comes from the disease, then it matters, like the, the effect what, that Daniela was mentioning is basically, well, we can say that the disease has a genetic cause, but it might still be a, ver be a very mild contribution, right? Like you have the gene and that increases your probability of developing cancer, but that is in addition of if you smoke, if you are under the sun all the time with UV uh, radiating on you, et cetera, et cetera, right? So this is just for the genetic cause, and it might not be, we call this uh, mu, uh, one sometimes or mu something because it's your different hypothesis, but how different, what is the distance really in between your mu zero and your mu one is the size effect and that is going to change the power of your system. It is also going to change uh, how fat this distribution is, right? Because you might have the same mu, but you might have a distribution that looks something like this or a distribution that is more sharp. And that is what Daniela was saying with the uh, sample size, et cetera, et cetera, right? Like there, there is like many different considerations and it's not the idea of this class that you absorb all of them. Just to remind you that the p-value is basically only talking about this part and that is too small. We also need to talk about the power. Yeah, and okay. that is related to the, the, the actual phenomena as well as your alternative hypothesis. Sorry. It's very complicated. I mean, it really is. <laughs> so don't, don't worry if you don't completely get We can give you material to try and, and go deeper into this. We are, we are going to do it in an activity, but we have also reading material. I think you already have the, the, the um, Dropbox thing. Um, there are some like, um, readings there about this. Uh, but it, it's not the idea of this course, because we have to cover many things, that you're like, oh, I already know what it is. And exact because Statisticians fight about it all the time as well. I mean, I've seen it. The, the, the American Statistical Association put out their first ever communicate to the world in 125 years of existence to tell people, like, please do not use the p-value. Everyone is using it wrong. Like, just, you know, it's, it's so confusing. And people, you know, fight about this. And, you know, everyone is looking for small p-values. And then it leads to a reproducibility crisis. So it's a very complicated topic. Do not worry if you are like very confused. I am still very confused. I have to go back and be like, what was this again? Um, but it's just good to be aware that if you calculate a p-value, it may not tell you what you think it's telling you, right? It's, it's just, that's the message from, from this class. And also that you need to report other things associated with the p-value, like the effect size, as Marina was saying, what is the difference between the means of these distributions? If it's very close, Maybe there's a real difference, but it's so small that we don't care about it. Right. And this is for the practical uh, you know, aspect of your research. Also, well, error bars, uh, what do they represent? Error bars can be calculated in many ways for uh, you know, statistical, um, sorry, uh, standard deviation, standard error. So it, it's used differently depending on what you're actually looking at. So it's, it's important to take care about these things. And uh, finally, yes, uh, worry about confidence interval and effect sizes, and that gives you a measure of the uncertainty of your results, right? Because if you just do it once, you have one sample, yay, that's it. I mean, it may not be true again. You may be fooling yourself, so the confidence interval will help you solve that, or just at least get a, uh, an idea of your uncertainty. So we finished today, almost on time.
But today's summary is that when you're starting your data-driven project first, spend a lot of time in looking at your data, cleaning it, planning exactly what tests you're going to do without doing the test yet, which, uh, without trying to get swayed by correlations, you see. That's not, this is independent. That's not the time to, for doing that. Um, it will take a long time. Again, yeah, I told you, three years on my PC. It takes a very long time, but it's worth it because in the end you can very quickly, then if you've planned it correctly, do all the tests that you want. So it's worth it. Now, be mindful, of course, of the statistical techniques that you're using. Make sure that the assumptions that these, you know, all these tests, that we saw t-tests and lots of them and uh, you know regression tests and everything has assumptions about you know how the distribution looks like um, you know sample sizes things like that so be sure that it fits with your data and finally of course if you're using p-values the elephant in the room think very carefully about what they mean what they're telling you about your question and if they're actually helping you <laughs> advance your research because sometimes it's more confusion than you know real Thanks. So, yeah, please. Yeah, so um, just uh, to clarify, we had an activity plan for today, but we decided to go slower with this because it, it is important. And I feel still it's not slow enough, but as Daniela was saying, I mean, at the end, statistics is its own thing and you can, you know, do a career, like a, a college degree on this, right? So it's not the intention of this class, it's just to give you an idea. But I think the activity is very informative because at least I learn a lot doing it. Um, so we are going to start next session with that activity and then we will move to what data we have visualization. planned for, for Visualiza today. Visualizing data. But finally, if you're confused, this is a good thing. This is a good outcome from this class. If you thought you understood the p-value and now you're confused, it's good. Because I thought I understood the p-value when I took statistics class and then I realized I really didn't. So uh, it's a good outcome. And okay, so we'll see you tomorrow for an activity and data visualization. Uh, also, the questions for the, the final questions ah, yes, for this please. session we will do after the activity tomorrow. So, you're free to go. Enjoy your day.